Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. And across the Middle East, hundreds of thousands of people are shaking the very foundations of 65 years of U.S. foreign policy. Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, and who knows where else. Now joining us to talk about the significance of the events today in Egypt is Phyllis Benish. She's a fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies focusing on the Middle East. Thanks for joining us. Good to be with you. So you've been glued to the TV watching what's been going on. What have you seen and what does it all mean? It's an extraordinary moment, Paul. Now, whether this is the beginning of something entirely new in the Middle East, we don't know yet, but it certainly is the beginning of the end of what exists. It's the end of an unchallengeable level of U.S. support, military, political, economic support for a host of Arab dictators across the region. For the first time, they are really threatened with being overthrown. The first, of course, in Tunisia. Ben Ali has been overthrown. He's gone into exile, interestingly, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and in Egypt, the most important U.S. Arab ally, there are protests going on around the country in every major city and in small villages. It's, it's unstoppable from what it looks like. There were incredible moments this morning when, as you say, I was glued to the television coverage, despite the fact that the Egyptian authorities had shut down the Internet, shut down Facebook and Twitter, shut down all cell phone networks, all that was left were landlines. I think their theory was keep people in their houses. But it didn't work. People still poured into the streets. In the October 6th bridge, one of the major bridges across Cairo, there was a moment I kept thinking it was like the crossing of the Edmund Petty Bridge, uh, the Edmund Pettus Bridge in the Selma to Montgom Montgomery March in the U.S. Civil Rights Movement. You had a bridge covered with people, with protesters, and suddenly there was an armored personnel carrier driving onto the bridge trying to force the protesters out. And they began to move, and then suddenly they turned on the armored personnel carrier, began to confront it, taunting the driver, throwing stones. Obviously, that couldn't hurt anything, but coming in in front of it so it could no longer move forward unless it was prepared to absolutely drive over the protesters, which it was not prepared to do. It turned around and at a very high speed drove off the bridge with people filling in behind it. In other cities, in Alexandria and, and uh, other parts of, of Egypt, you had instances of the police joining uh, the protesters and saying, I'm not going to shoot. And this becomes very crucial. This is what made the difference in Tunisia, where the historically apolitical military refused to engage. The police were divided. I don't know if it was half and half, but there certainly were not enough. There wasn't enough of a critical mass of police who were prepared to go after the protesters. And the protesters won as a result. They took the streets. They kept the streets. In Egypt right now, that's one of the big questions. Where will the police go and where will the military go? The military in Egypt is not like the military in Tunisia. It's a big, powerful military armed by one and a half billion dollars worth of U.S. military aid every year for a country that has no external enemies. By treaty with the U.S., it can't attack Israel. There's nobody else for it to attack. What does that mean? It means it's going after its own people. Now, these regimes, uh, the Egyptian regime was a product of the Cold War. This Mubarak regime was going to be the, uh, and, and before it's Sadat and the whole, this modern Egyptian uh, elite was a bulwark against communism. Exactly. Same thing in many of the other parts of the uh, Middle East, especially the Sauds and others. So the, uh, the issue of the, this, all this financial military support was, first of all, Cold War directed and then anti-Islamic directed. This is against terrorism. We've got to keep these regimes well, in power. Well, there's something in between those two. Certainly the Cold War drive was what really started this. This was at a period in the early 50s when uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser was the leader of Egypt and one of the leaders of the non-aligned movement, which according to the U.S. put it in the pocket of the Soviet Union. So going after Nasser was a key aspect of this. When Nasser was, was overthrown, when, when uh, uh, first Sadat and then Mubarak came to power, this was exactly what the U.S. wanted, a government in Egypt that could prevent Egypt from being pulled into what was now the nationalist camp. During the Cold War, it was the socialist camp. Either one was anathema, of course, to the United States. But before then, we get to the anti-terrorism And they tried to conflate side. those things. And of course, they tried to conflate them. Then later, we get to the anti-terrorism side. But in between that, we have the issue of Israel. The, the Egyptian government under uh, Sadat was the first Arab government to be willing to sign a peace deal with, Egypt, uh, with Israel after the 67 war to get back control of part of the Sinai. They didn't even get the entire Sinai, but they got most of it. In doing so, of course, they abandoned the Palestinians. 
And this is what led to enormous antagonism towards Sadat and ultimately was responsible for his assassination. In the later period, you then have the shift to what we're seeing now, where Egypt becomes our great ally in the struggle against terrorism. You know, the same with all the other leaders in, in the region. But what we're hearing a little bit differently now, for the first time, we're hearing from the Obama administration, from Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, particularly from President Obama himself, something other than an absolute embrace of these dictators. We're hearing, yes, Egypt is an important ally, and they have played an important role vis-a-vis -vis peace with Israel. But we would caution the Egyptian regime that they must allow for the expression of uh, dissent. Well, I don't think he said dissent, but the expression of views of the population well, to make their needs known. Well, of course, in, in U.S. interest, it would be okay to have Mubarak without Mubarak. If you could have some replacement Absolutely. but continue with the same policy, of course, they don't care be, whether the Mubarak family no, is on the outs. That's, of course, true. That's, that's a, a personal issue. Uh, Hillary Clinton went out of her way to talk about how Mubarak and his wife, Suzanne Mubarak, are personal friends of hers. It wasn't clear to me exactly what's ahead. Are they talking about giving them asylum here in the United States, perhaps? Uh, I don't think they'd be too comfortable finding asylum in Saudi Arabia like Ben Ali did, but who knows. But I think your point is absolutely right. The U.S. wants that system in place. Who's at the top of it is not that important. What's different now is that what the Egyptian people are demanding is not simply getting rid of those at the top. They don't want to just replace Hosni Mubarak or even Hosni Mubarak and his son Jamal Mubarak, who's the heir apparent at the moment. They want a new system. This is a demand for the kind of fundamental, if I can use that term, change, the structural change that people have been looking for in these sclerotic regimes that have not needed to change because repression was all they needed to keep things down, to keep things from, from getting out of control. And, and, and if that change to begin with is a opening up a space for some real democratic engagement by the population and then a fight over what that policy will be, that will that's, be a big step. That's huge. What we're, what we're hearing now is that what people are demanding is not simply new elections that are not corrupt. I mean, Egypt sort of takes the prize, I would say, around the world in global, in global recognition of corrupt elections where Mubarak gets elected with 96 percent of the vote, that sort of thing. It's really preposterous. But that's not what they're asking for. They're asking for a different kind of democracy, for people's democracy for participatory democracy, not simply electoral democracy. Those are very different concepts. And the sophistication of the Egyptian protest movement is that they're making very clear that this isn't just about getting somebody else from the elite in there. The question, for example, of Mohammed al-Baradai, who played a very important role when he was the head of the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, the UN's nuclear watchdog. The U.S. excoriated him for those years claiming that he was supporting Iran's nuclear weapons, which they don't have, of course, et cetera, et cetera. And he stood up on Iraq in a way no And he stood up on Iraq in a way that nobody did, exactly. He stood up to the U.S. on numerous occasions. The question now is, does he have the kind of credibility at home, given that he has spent these last 20 years as an international civil servant? He has enormous credibility globally. Does he have enough credibility at home? But what's, imp incre what's impressive about it, I think, and what's encouraging is that He's not coming back saying, I'm the new leader. He's coming back saying, I will be in the streets with the people. If they want me to play a role, I will play that role. He's open to it. He's not demanding it. He's not claiming that he has been the leader of this incredible movement that we see now in the streets. So I, I guess uh, it's still hard to tell how this is going to go. I mean, a lot has to do with how just how big are the splits within the army and the police force. And Absolutely. And we also see there's a very different uh, scenario in terms of civil society than if we compare it, for example, to the period of the, the, late, uh, uh, the late 80s into the 90s in Latin America, where you had one after another a kind of reverse domino effect of military dictatorships backed by the U.S. collapsing one after another and being replaced some by U.S.-backed neoliberal democracies, quote, and others by organizational uh, shifts that really allowed room for new progressive parties like the, the Workers' Party in Brazil that brought Lula to power in, in the wake of the overthrow of the dictatorship. What's different in the Middle East, you don't have the same level of very sophisticated ties between political parties, civil society, trade unions, this kind of mobilization that had been going on for years, challenging power in that immediate way. Now these, we have a very rich civil society, but they've never had the opportunity to have this chance to challenge power, now, how they come together. Now the other thing I think that took everybody some 
watchers, everybody from the outside, perhaps not Egyptians, from by surprise though, is that this was not led by the Muslim Brotherhood. Everyone thought the only people Absolutely. with the sort of backbone to stand up to Mubarak were, were the Islamists, but this didn't come from Well, them. interestingly, the, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is known to be a very cautious, moderate kind of organization that has rarely challenged Mubarak. They have a kind of, they're officially outlawed, but they're officially tolerated. They're in a kind of in-between position, but they have never launched a full-scale uh, public, public mobilization like this. Their leaders have not wanted to see people going into the streets. They feared, and it turns out they're right, they would not control that kind of mobilization. It was only reluctantly, last night, Thursday night, they finally announced, yes, on Friday we will join the demonstrations. And they did, but they did not try, as far as I can tell, and certainly did not succeed, we know that, at taking over those demonstrations. You heard a few random calls of Allah Akbar, but basically th there was no one who could say this was an Islamist-led uh, demonstration or a demonstration where the religious demands were primary. There were no one set of demands that were primary. There were political demands around human rights, uh, release of political prisoners, the end to torture, the right to assemble. And, there and were economic, Mubarak out. And Mubarak out. There were economic demands about jobs, about opportunities. There were demands about education, ending the escalation of fees for schools. There was a host of demands, people coming to it with all kinds of their own personal issues. But what came out as a whole was the demand for fundamental change now, if you're in looking the entire at the, system. If you're looking at what's going on from Israel, what might be the implications starting with the siege of Gaza? Well, I think there's not likely to be any big change in the relationship with Israel right away. A new government that might come in, I think, is unlikely to, for example, unsign the Camp David Treaty that But might they be less cooperative on the siege of Gaza? On Gaza, I think you will see an immediate shift. I think whoever comes into power is likely to take a position on Gaza that is far more uh, uh, open, that says we are not going to do Israel's bidding, that will widen and open, perhaps permanently, the Rafah crossing between Gaza and Egypt and allow full access for Palestinians and Egyptians and internationals to move freely in and out of that border. That will put enormous pressure on Israel because it will mean, number one, that the, the uh, tunnels under the Gaza border that have been the only way that Gazans have survived economically will no longer be necessary. They, everything, goods and services, as well as people, can come and go freely through a new Egyptian crossing. It will put Israel in this incredible position of imposing this blockade which has no meaning on the ground because people just go through, through Egypt. And it will isolate Israel and show the political nature of this, uh, of this blockade. Thank you. And for people hearing a siren, we're in Washington, and you hear a lot of sirens. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. And of course, we'll be continuing to cover the Egypt, uh, events in Egypt and across the Middle East.